Welcome, friends and family in Christ, to our Sunday sermon. Today, we explore the intricate design of God's idea of family life in a sermon entitled, Picture Perfect Family. We will delve into key verses from Colossians and Psalms, focusing on the significant roles each family member plays within a Christian household. Open your hearts and minds as we begin our journey into understanding the Picture Perfect Family. come to a section today we're calling the picture perfect family the picture perfect family and um, is there a picture perfect family does one exist well we have some ideals in the word of God we have some goals that we look to and in this passage of scripture that's found in Colossians chapter 3 we want to look at four verses in particular that talk about wives and husbands and children and fathers or parents. Colossians chapter 3 verses 18 down through verse 21. Let me read these verses. You see them up here on the screen and then we'll have a word of prayer and we'll get into this. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. And finally, fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Let's pray. God, as we go to your word, as we open up and hear you speak to us through your word, Lord, I know that these verses that we have before us today speak to all of us as family members, as, family, as part of the family of God, if we're a Christian, and part of our homes that are represented here today. And Lord, they present to us some ideals, some goals for us. And Lord, help us as they uh, command us here to indeed Submit to you in all things and desire to be well-pleasing to you and to be fitting unto you, Lord. Help us to pay attention to what you have to say to us today. For it's your word one day that will judge us and how we lived our lives and the things that we've done. And Lord, help us. Help us to strive to ask for your forgiveness in ways that we have fallen short. We thank you for your word today. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. Now, most of us, uh, present tense or past tense, have, uh, basically some of us older folks, not necessarily older, but we have a, a professional family portrait uh, hanging on the wall. Uh, I know ours, our professional family portrait graduated to my parents' home. They had it hanging on the wall there. And uh, they used to be, you know, a little bit expensive. You would actually go to a studio, all right? And uh, the routine back then, you go to a professional photographer, and uh, you'd get dressed up in outfits, hopefully that didn't clash and you'd have your hair and everything in place, and you would hopefully strike a pose and get a great big smile. Uh, it wasn't like the cell phone days where, you know, if you messed up, then you just took another and another and another and another. And the goal, in essence, was that, well, you wanted to capture a moment in time, but you also wanted to present a, a family a group setting. Uh, and also uh, maybe present a family that uh, has their stuff together, uh, that uh, doesn't get into big arguments and that smiles like they do on the picture and give one another, each other a lot of love. You know, you're one big happy family, father, mother, sister, brother, so on and so forth. 
we all have expectations for our families. And uh, we, want, we want to be a picture-perfect family in a lot of ways. Uh, we might want visitors to come to our home and say, you know, that looks like a happy family. They look like, you know, they love one another and, uh, and appreciate one another. But we know with pictures, they don't present all the facts, all the reality. Uh, families don't always live up to those pictures. It's not all smiles. Life has a way of dealing us different issues that we have to deal with. So as families, we have good days and we have bad days. And there's no such thing as a completely 24-7 uh, perfect, picture-perfect family. I'm interested, and I've always been, that if you watch some of these crime shows, the true-to-life ones, where it's kind of a docudrama, where they show one of these portraits, one of these pictures where the kids got dressed up, mom and dad got dressed up, and they went and got this picture, and it's hanging on the wall at their house. They will show you that in these crime dramas. There's one key reason they do it, because something bad has happened. I want to show you one up here on the screen that I, that I uh, found. This is a family. We, there is obviously four boys there. This is Rusty and Andrea Yates, all right? Uh, Rusty worked as an engineer for NASA. You know, we just, I just did a funeral a few weeks ago for John that worked at NASA. And Andrea graduated as Val Victorian of her class and went on to go to college and to become a nurse. They described themselves as evangelical Christian family. And uh, they, one of the things they stated that they wanted to have as many children as they possibly could have. And so Andrea, uh, through a period of time uh, of 90 months, was pregnant 40 months of that time. They had four children, four boys, and then they had a, a little girl that's not in the picture. Well, one day the husband left. This is back in 2001. He left the house to go to work. And his wife proceeded to, after he went to work, to drown every one of those four children along with a little six-month-old girl. They had the girl. Drowned at every one. She called 911. And she said she drowned her children because she was not a good mother. She went on to say that uh, she was tortured by secret agents that were watching her through invisible cameras. And threatened by talking bowls of cereal. And directly challenged by Satan himself. She said she wanted to save her children from Satan. From Satan. Now, after a couple of trials, court trials that she went through, she was found ultimately guilty by reason of insanity. She was placed in a mental institution where now she makes crafts during the day that they sell for charity. And she spends time in her bio, watching videos of the children that she drowned, the children that she took their lives. Now, in her case, as is in case in so many, yearly she become, comes before a review board to see if she's able to be released back out into society because that's been some 22 years ago that this crime happened and all those children of course now would be up in their late 20s and she does not seek to be released thankfully now that obviously is an extreme example of what a picture perfect family is not but i this morning want to remind you something when we read verses like i just read to you this morning we can get discouraged because we look at different ways that we fall short and we think I could never live up to that but I want to share with you anytime you open God's word you're looking at 
goals. You're looking at aspirations. You're looking at ideals. I want to show you, in fact, up here on the screen. What is an ideal? What is an ideal? Well, an ideal is defined as a conception of something in its absolute perfection. Now, we're not going to reach that. No matter how hard we try. No matter how hard we keep the try to keep the cla uh, uh, house clean. You know, I've told my wife... We, we just need to give up on trying to take care of just basic things. We got some furniture out for our front yard. We got a little a nice white stool and some white rocking chairs. But we also got a new dog. And that new dog likes to chew on wood. He likes, he's already chewed on the handles, on the, on the, on the rocking chairs, and he's already, I warned them we don't need no dog, but they wanted a dog, all right? So we, you know, we try to have things and keep them look nice, and lo and behold, something comes along and upsets the apple cart. So we're not going to reach that. One that is regarded as a standard or model of perfection or excellence. Again, that is a goal there that we can shoot for. And then an ultimate object of endeavor or a goal. And then finally an honorable or worthy principle or aim. Now, as I preach from God's word to you this morning, I'm preaching God's ideals. These are his goals. These are his pursuits that he wants for us. These are his standards, his priorities, his principles. Now, I, I go back to the first family, okay? The first family, in so many ways, was the ideal family. Think about it. You had Adam and Eve. We can debate on couples and the choices of their spouse. Oh, why did he ever choose her? Why did she ever choose him? Well, no wonder it didn't work out. They were just so different. But let's go back to the beginning. Who picked out the mate for Adam? God did. Who picked the maid out for Eve, all right? God did. But imagine if we could put a picture up here on the screen of Adam and Eve and their two boys, Cain and Abel. And they're smiling and they're happy. And now think about it. They live in a perfect environment, perfect climate. I mean, they've only got one restriction. Just leave one thing alone. But imagine we would have a picture of what? Two boys. Two boys. How did that turn out? They put the dis in dysfunctional, didn't they? Because think about it. Think about it, all right? They started out in this perfect environment, but what happened? Well, the two came together. They became one flesh. They had a child. They had another child. One child, what happened? People could point to Adam and Eve and say, you know, Adam, you know, Eve, you raised a cane. You know, we, we use that expression today, raising Cain, all right? But also, they raised an Abel. We can magnify their, again, mistakes and whatever point they had in, in the way Cain turned out to be the first murderer and to murder his own brother, but we can also look at Abel. One decided to go what? The crooked path. One decided, named Abel, to go the straight and narrow path. Now, who's to bless and who's to blame? So, God has an ideal for us, all right? The same Bible that tells us to bring up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord also tells us that we all fall short of the glory of God. So that doesn't mean, though, that we stop reaching. And that doesn't mean that we stop aiming for the ideal. That doesn't mean that we wave the white flag and, and give up. Because God is a God of a second chance. He's also a God of, uh, of unlimited forgiveness. And what God has for us today that I want to share with you is His vision of a picture-perfect family. Now... I want to say, thank God he has a standard. Thank God we can open it up. Thank God we can aim at it. And we can all admit from time to time 
Very often, we miss, all right? If you aim at nothing, though, you'll hit it every time, right? You think about it. But it's always better to shoot for something. If we miss the target, we shouldn't sell our gun, right? So, you know, sin is defined as missing the mark. So, again, God always has an ideal, and it's always been the same. Now, we know, unfortunately, in our day and age, it's harder to have a family, to, to raise a family, than it's ever been before because we're redefining what a family is. We're saying we have books now in, public, in some public schools that talk about my two dads, my two, my two moms. We have changed what a family is, what even makes up a family. And as I've, you've heard me say before, we have women calling other women their wives. We have men calling other men their wives. <coughs> so the problem that we have is just growing in leaps and bounds of the things that we have to deal with. So let's look at this example that we have today of this picture-perfect family. And the first thing I want to share with you is what I want to call a picture-perfect wife. A picture-perfect wife. Now, let me say up front, without, you know, fear of contradiction, the fact this is describing a Christian environment. You will notice, as I read these verses, he talked about pleasing to the Lord. He talked about fitting to the Lord. He's talking here about Christians, a Christian couple, not a, a Christian and a lost, cup, a lost person that are married together. He's speaking to Christians. Remember, he talk, gave us in the introduction in this chapter that we're putting on a new person. Remember, we're throwing away all those old things. And one of the things, again, that he talks about is, again, how different we are to be now. Okay? So we see here about a wife. Again, the context is wife. This is the wife who is putting on a new person. And remember in the context of which it was written, if you would write, read some things about how women were treated back then, it was atrocious. It was atrocious. They had no rights. They had no, again, ability to even, in essence, divorce their husband by the laws. And it was the Judeo-Christian ethic that actually brought in the idea of how you were supposed to treat your wife. And so we see here, first of all, something very, very important about what I've talked about. Our faith that we come and smile and sing about when we come to church ought to be something that we take home with us. Take home with us. If it doesn't work anywhere but here, we've got a massive problem. We've got a massive problem. So it needs to be something. Our faith may, must come home with us. Now, what happens when a person becomes a Christian? What happens? What kind of a wife does that person become? Well, they become a new wife. And part of the obligation of that new wife is the basis of authority. You know, this word right here, submit, is a dirty word in our culture. Dirty word in our culture. For one reason, it's completely uh, misconstrued and, not, and not, people don't understand really what it all that it means. But I'm telling you, in each one of these instances, and don't miss this, Paul is hitting the sore spot. He's given us one sentence, one verse on each one of these individuals, the wife, the husband, the child, and the parents. He's given us one verse, and that one verse hits at one of the sore spots that we're going to deal with. And here, it has to deal with wives submitting to their husbands, and there's a key reason for this. Now, as I mentioned, studies showed, in fact, I was reading a Gallup poll showed that 69% of the public disagreed with the statement, wives should submit to their husbands. Why? Well, they view those, that word submit as slave, inferior, obedience, or doormat. In other words, they've taken that word and made it something it was never meant to be. I want to show you something up here on the screen. Here are here are uh, some words I want to share with you. Success in marriage is more than finding the right person. It's being the right person. 
See that? Success in marriage is more than finding the right person. It's being the right person. See, the responsibility falls on every one of us as individuals. We're so guilty as so many times as firing a gun at somebody and saying, he's not what he should be. She's not what he should be, what she should be. So I'm at odds with them when I need to look at myself in the mirror and see how am I measuring up you can't be the right person without without having the right lord amen and to carry out this command as i've mentioned this morning requires spiritual discipline nowhere does it say that the wife is to obey her husband it says that about children children are to obey their parents it's not saying here that the wife is to obey her husband the word uh, submission means to put yourself under put yourself under his care his watch his love again we're talking about Christians here we're talking about new people that he's defined the, that are putting off these old ways of doing things and their old way of thinking things and they've changed and this is not forced it's voluntary voluntary you know, God, in His Word, has a chain of command. I want to remind you of it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It says, But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, first thing I want to point out to you is, is if a lady would go against being submissive to her husband... She's going against the example that Christ set of being, uh, being submissive to the Father. See, he's defining for us the chain of command. God's authority. Think about Jesus. All power, the Bible says, were given unto him. But what did he gratefully and thankfully do on his mission upon planet earth? He submitted to his heavenly Father who he treated as his head. See, as, as I want you to see up on the screen, what we're talking about in the home, what we're talking about in the church, what we're talking about in the world is plural leadership and singular headship. In fact, the world has come along and whether it knew it or realized it or not, they've modeled this. You think about it. You go to a company. There's what? There's one head of that company, right? He's CEO. He's president. And then what? He's got underlings. He's got vice presidents and so on and so forth. You go, in fact, uh, uh, to a, a sports team. What do they have? They have a head coach. And then they have the assistant coaches. You get on an airplane. You have a pilot and you have a co-pilot. So that's the way almost like God has hardwired this world, wired this world, and it now includes it as far as the family. So I go back to that verse again. <coughs> and I want to point out, wives submit to your own husbands. Notice, here's our motivation. It's fitting to the Lord. If that, if that alone does not make us want to follow His word, then nothing will. We want to obey Jesus, right? Submission is not just wives uh, submitting to their husbands. They're submitting to the Lord. To the Lord. The primary relationship in a wife's life is her relationship to the Lord. And she will model this as she submits to her husband. She's showing, I'm submitting to the Lord because God gave me this husband. Again, we're talking about a Christian relationships. We're talking about a Christian wife and a Christian husband. So they come together, okay? Now, it's not that, well, she's just a submissive type. It's just they are, they are expected to submit to the Lord and has nothing to do with their husband's, uh, you know, uh, intelligence or with his giftedness or capabilities or any of those things. It has simply to do with honoring the Lord. And it doesn't mean also that she doesn't have an opinion. It doesn't mean that she doesn't have some, some uh, thoughts that she can express and that she can come to her own conclusions and so on and so forth. 
you know, it doesn't mean that she can't, uh, you know, like, honey, I wanted you to go vote, and you vote exactly how I tell you. Now, stop and think about this. It was only 100 years ago that women were given the right to vote. That was in 1920. So, again, think about how much better off the world would be if we didn't do that and allow that. How much better shape we'd be in. Amen? Amen. Now they're taking over. All right? But you, you stop and think. It doesn't mean by being submissive to the wife that no matter what he tells you, hey, if it's not fitting to the Lord, if it's sinful, you don't obey him. You don't submit to him. You don't submit to what he says. You know, and, and, and again, so often the problem is a control issue. See, that's what God is trying to establish. When you have a split in the home, so often it's a control issue. I want to be in control. She wants to be in control. And we just couldn't come together. We had these irreconcilable differences. Well, God wants what's best for both of them. And guess who wants to be in control? God wants to be in control. So, what is the number one indicator of salvation? A changed life. And how will we show a changed life? Well, in the case of the wife, is to be submissive to her husband and to be, again, in, best, in essence, fitting in the Lord. There's a second thing I want to share with you this morning. And that is what I want to call, again, a picture-perfect husband. He says, wives, here's your responsibility. He says, men, here's your responsibility. And here is a theme that he mentions over and over, and I'm going to share with you some of them this morning. And that is, husbands love your wives. You talk about sore spots. The sore spot with, a, with the wife apparently is being submissive to her husband and in essence being submissive to the Lord. But the problem with the husband is what? Loving his wife. Now that word husband, I want to challenge you this morning to think about this. That word husband means it's got the word band in it. It means for a person, that husband, that leader, to what? Put a band around his house. He has got more of the responsibility to keep that family together. Because he is the head of that family. So he's responsible for, has greater responsibility for holding them together. And there are really two commands here. First of all, he says, love your wives. Love your wives. And then he says, do not be bitter toward them. Do not be harsh towards them. Do not talk to them. Sometimes the way that we're guilty of doing. Don't do that. You know, a lot of times, and, and I believe this too, he puts this here because there are times that a wife is not submissive to her husband the way she should be. So what happens? Well, he gets bitter toward them. He gets bitter towards his wife. I heard a story about a couple that came upon a wishing well. And the wife leaned over and made a wish and threw a penny in the well. And the husband decided, well, he'd make a wish too. So he leaned over and he leaned over too far and he fell into the well. Well, the wife just stood there looking down into the well and finally said, well, I guess it really does work. So she got her wish. But a couple having marital difficulties, no matter, again, it's about how we treat one another. You know, a counselor asks a couple, he says, don't you have anything in common? And the wife answered, yes, neither one of us can stand the other. Now, that's not what we want to have in common. Kind of like the lady that said, my husband won a trip for two to Hawaii and he went twice, all right? You don't want that. You don't want that, all right? Now, notice what can creep into a marriage. What busts up marriage so often? Bitterness. 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 You know, one of the things that I've seen, and I've said it about our, our marriage and anyone who ever gets married, they don't know what they're getting into. I really believe that. We, you can, I've seen, and you, you've heard of it too, high school sweethearts. Oh, they've known each other for a long time. They knew each other in high school. They went on. They went through college. They got to know one another better. I mean, this wasn't the, you know, this uh, quick romance thing. This wasn't three months and cloud of smoke and so on and so forth. This, over a long span of time, they got to know one another. And the marriage still fell apart. Because we have these ideals. We have, well, you know, 
I, he can't do anything wrong. Or she can't. She's the perfect man, mate for me. Perfect match for me. And so often, we're blind to one another's faults. I want to share with you up here on the screen some way things turn out sometimes. She married him because he's strong and masculine. She divorced him because he was, he was a very dominating male. All right? He married her because she was so fragile and petite. He divorced her because she was so weak and helpless. See, what, was, what I'm getting at is what attracted them was the very thing after they were married for a while that detracted them. Notice she chose him because he knew how to provide a good living. She left him because all he thought about was the business. He married her because she was steady and sensible. He divorced her because she was boring and dull. You know, one of the things that I know for sure about me, and I know it about you, we have a problem, all right? And that problem is we can naturally be self-centered and prideful. Self-centered and prideful. Here in this verse, Paul says, love your wife. I want to remind you, just five verses previously, Paul said in the same chapter in Colossians 3 and verse 14, he said, above all things put on love, which is the bond of perfection. You know the word for love there? Oh, it's a hard word. You know, the Bible has four words, the Greek language has four words for love, and it's the word agape that we've all heard of. Not sloppy agape, it's agape that talks about for God so loved. That's the same word that's used here. That's the same love that he wants a husband to have for his wife. In other words, he would willing to do what Jesus did for the church, his bride. And what was that? He was willing to lay down his life for that bride. I want you to see again how it's emphasized in Scripture. In Ephesians 5 and verse 25, it says again, why does he keep telling us this, guys? He says, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Now, we could say this about that. That is, don't say you die for her if you won't live for her. If you won't live for her. You know, us men, there's a lot of things we need to die to in order to love our wives. A lot of things we need to die to. You know, he goes on to say in just a few verses later in Ephesians 5 and verse 28. So husbands, here he says it again. And we just read it in Colossians, and I could show you a lot of other verses too. Husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So, think about that. The closest relationship we have on planet earth is not child and parent. It's husband and wife. Husband and wife. You know, you could ask the question... I heard a woman one time was asked if she had to choose between her husband and her son, which one would she choose? And she said, I choose my son. That husband is no relation of mine. All right. I'm going to tell you something. He's not only a relation of yours. Notice. He's part of you. He's part of you. You know, a new dad was showing a picture of his newborn baby and he said, I finally understand the scriptures that says this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And I've said that about my children. But that's not what the scriptures say. I want you to see in Genesis chapter 2, verse 23 and 24, the Bible says, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. His wife, Eve. She came from the man. Now they're one. And they're going to come together. In, in, uh, in, notice, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and, she shall be, and they shall be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. One flesh. See, that's the idea here, is that, you know, what did Jesus say? What therefore God hath put together, no, let no man put, uh, put asunder. 
If I hurt my wife, I'm hurting myself. If I strike out at her, I'm striking out at myself. So in essence, he's saying, be good to yourself. Love your spouse. Love your wife. See, God is, God's intent is that we are one flesh. That is, we have one vision. One vision. Two visions is division. All right? We don't want that. And that's never more true than it, when we come to the next thing we're going to look at in raising children. We've got to be on the same page. And our children are watching us. And they're ultimately going to model us in so many ways when they begin their family and begin having their own children and raise their own children. How did mom and dad handle this? What kind of an example were they to us? See, Christianity has always been relational. Jesus wants to have a personal relationship with us. He wants us to have a personal relationship with our wives, with our spouses, and with our children. And so Paul here is showing, trying to show to us all that picture-perfect family. This is God's ideal, and this is what Christianity is supposed to do for your home, which leads me to a third thing I want to share up here on the screen. And now we come to the children. What about a perf picture perfect child? Notice again, children obey your parents in all things. Again, two commands. Second, for this is well pleasing to the Lord. Again, we see this works for Christian families. This works for Christian kids. If a child is a child of God, then that child will obey their parents because it pleases the Lord. It pleases the Lord. You know, one of the things that Scripture warns us of is that the fact of rebellion. Rebellion amongst kids. It says rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. The Bible says rebellion is bound up in the heart of a child. That's why God tells children here to obey their parents. And right here in this same chapter that we've already covered. In Colossians 3 and verse 6. He says the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. Now think about what God is trying to teach us here. He's trying to teach children about life. Life 101. What is life built? What is built into life? You got to what? Respect authority. All right? You go to school. You respect the teacher. You go to college. You respect the professor. You go out into the vocational world. You get a job. What? You respect. You're under the authority of the boss of that job. All right? You're, you start driving. What do you got to do? You've got to obey the laws, all right? Obey the laws, the traffic laws and all of these things. All of these things. So God is trying to make it easy on you. He's saying, here's the breeding ground. Here's the area where you begin to learn what authority is all about. Now, if you disobey, then there's negative consequences, obviously. The older you get, the more those uh, consequences become more and more severe. For instance, you disobey your parents and you might get a spanking or, or you might get, uh, you know, uh, uh, grounded and so on and so forth. You go into college, you go into school. What happens if you disobey? You might flunk the course. You get into college, they're not going to mamby-pamby you anymore. They're going to baby you. You either, you either sink or swim. You'll either make the grades or you get put on academic probation and you won't be long till you're done, all right? And then you get out on a job. What happens with your boss? You disobey your boss. You don't respect his authority. What happens? You lose your job. You get fired from your job. So again, you go out here and you break the laws of the land. What happens? Well, you go to court, you might go to jail. So obeying your parents is training for life. And here's the bottom line. And everyone here knows this is true. Every one of us, if we've got any common sense to us at all, knows this is very true. Everybody, and this is all through these verses, everybody in this world has to report to somebody. And I'm going to tell you something. When my life is over, the Bible says... We all must stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 
Ultimately, when life is over, we're going to report to the ultimate authority, the final authority in life. So it doesn't stop just when children leave home. All right, it continues on in our life, and we have to learn this principle of submitting to authority. And if we don't learn it at home, we're going to have a hard time in life, <clears throat> and somebody will put in our file, struggles with authority, all right? The ultimate file, struggles with authority. So what he says here is plain and simple. Children, obey your parents. Number one motivation. This is well-pleasing to the Lord. You know, we don't have a whole bunch of verses that just say, matter of fact, this will please God. Do this, and you'll please the Lord. Here's one of them. Here's one of them that we have, all right? You want to please the Lord, because what? Ultimately, that's what life is about, and that's what the afterlife is about. Well done, my good and faithful servant, all right? And here's a fourth and final thing I want to share with you this morning. And that is the picture-perfect parent. Notice he says in verse 21, Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Now, it's interesting that when he comes to the child here, he's got this negative warning. He, in essence, is saying there's some things going on that need to be stopped. And really, in essence, that's what he's saying in so many... He's saying, wives, are you submitting to your husbands? He's saying, husbands, are you loving your wives? All right. He's saying, children, are you obeying your, your parents? And now he's saying, parents, fathers, are you provoking your children? In other words, are you causing your, your children to become discouraged? You know, other, some other translations of this verse says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Fathers, do not vex your children. Fathers, don't make your children resentful. See, again, they're learning from us. Are they learning from us discouragement or encouragement? I want to tell you something. It's tough being a child in this culture. How many of you, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands because I've done this before on a Wednesday night. How many of you would like to start all over your life and go through school the way it is now? Who would want to do that? I mean, seriously. You know, think of all the modern event inventions that have been invented that have made it harder for a child to be a child. What about cyberbullying? You know... You could have bullying in school back when I was in school, but now you can take it home with you, all right? People can get on Facebook. They can get on these uh, social media, and they can lambast you. They can make fun of you. They can say, don't have anything to do with that person. They can make up lies about you and so on and so forth. How do you respond to that? Talk about eroding the child's self-esteem. How about... I, I could just use a couple examples today that I, we experienced. My granddaughter's in the sixth grade. They had a girl. Now think about this, a 12-year-old girl who was wanting to be a transgender child. How many 12-year-olds? How many? You know they passed a law in Florida? They had to pass a law to make it, and it takes effect the 1st of July, that you had to be 18 to decide if you wanted to do that nonsense. Now, I want, I, again, in the beginning, God made them male and female. But, oh, they're so mixed. Here was a transgender, or this girl that thought she wanted to be transgender. She writes on the bathroom wall of the bathroom that she's going to kill herself the next day. We get a call from school, all right? A call is sent out. Did we have any issues like that when I was a child? Was there any transgenderism back when I... Was there any LGBTQ alphabet stuff back then? And then they had a situation where a kid claimed he had a gun in his backpack. I don't understand the backpack deal. I think that's, that's asking for trouble. We didn't have backpacks back when I was a kid. But we could leave a gun on a stock in a truck when I was in high school and never had a situation where that child would think of going into that school and shooting. But now what? It's a common, almost every week occurrence 
that something like this is happening. And you know who we're losing? We're not only losing the children, we're losing the teachers. They're retiring right and left. They're wanting to get out of this mess. The monkeys are running the zoo. The criminals are running the asylum, insane asylum. We've allowed it to happen in our generation. And then, on top of that, we have things like, here's a word you're going to hear quite a bit of here in the next several years. Chat GPT. Chat GPT can do all kinds of things. It can write a song in just a mere uh, couple of minutes. It can write you a term paper for your class that you'll get a good grade on. All you got to do is get that little app and it'll take care of you. And so we have now what? An inordinate amount of opportunity to what? To cheat. The temptation out there. Oh, and how many of us have sweated some tests? And I've heard of situations, you know, we let the kids bring, in a lot of the schools, let them bring the cell phone in the school. They take a picture. They send it to their buddy. You know, they, he gets the same grade as they got and so on and so forth. All of these things. And on top of all of these advances, 22% of high school students in recent surveys said they had seriously considered suicide. Suicide. So what I'm getting at is children need encouragement more than they ever have before. Because if they, they're not going to get built up in the world. So if we don't try to build them up and listen to them, which we can all be guilty of, the warning is the possibility they're going to get discouraged. And we know discouragement at a young age can lead to things such as suicide and other problems. We can't forget, and I want you to see up here on the screen, that children are a blessing from the Lord. Psalm 127 says, children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from Him. And then here's old grandpa saying, grandchildren are the crown of old men. All right? Amen. Now, we need to first realize and accept that. Oh, we have some days where we say, you know, Oh, dearly beloved blessing, if I could get my hands around your neck for what you've done today. All right. But the devil shoves, but the Lord leads. What is, goal, what is, what is the goal that we have for our children? We're talking about Christians here. John, second, or third John, excuse me, which only has one chapter. The goal of parenting is godliness. John writes, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Do you see that? That's what makes me stick my chest out. That's what makes me say, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. I want to spend not just earth with them. I want to spend all eternity with them. And now, as we head down the home stretch, I want to remind you about Jesus. Jesus was perfect. He was the picture-perfect Savior. But He had imperfect parents. And we read in Luke chapter 2 and verse 51, how did Jesus respond to those imperfect parents? The Bible says he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. As imperfect as they were, he still admitted and still bowed to their wishes. I want to show you up here, where we've been talking about picture perfect families. I want to share with you something. And I... I this is one of the most important things that I've shared with you in this message. And it gives us an idea. A perfect husband is a man who does not demand a perfect wife. A perfect wife is a woman who does not demand a perfect husband. A perfect child is a child who does not demand a perfect parents. And perfect parents are those who do not demand perfect children. Amen? That's us. See, now I want to tell you something in conclusion. God loved us despite our imperfections. But I want to tell you something. He does not accept us with our imperfections. He does not accept us. As I want to show you up here on the screen. And this is the last thing I want to share with you. Only perfect people can enter God's heaven. And there are no perfect people. 
People think are dying left and right. People that you read their obituaries today think, I'm going to go before God and God is going to accept me on my terms because, hey, I was better than my neighbor. I was just as good as so-and-so. I had a rotten parent and I was a lot better than they were. I had a rotten brother and I was a lot better person than him. God, you surely love me and you'll surely accept me. But there are no perfect people and you're not going to enter heaven as an imperfect person. We needed a perfect life and Jesus lived the perfect sinless life for us. That's why we need Jesus. I quote 1 Peter 3 verse 22 says about Jesus who committed no sins nor was deceit found in his mouth. 1 John 3 5 and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him there is no sin. See only a perfect person could take sin away. And as 2 Corinthians tells us, For He made Him, that is, God the Father made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. How can I make it to heaven? Not in my own righteousness, because the Bible says that's filthy rags. I need the righteousness of God. How do I get that righteousness? I only get it in Him. In Him. Have you accepted Him? Him. Have you accepted what He's done for you? You can't do it. He can do it. You can't live the Christian life. You can't. But He can. Will you let Him do it today? Will you... Thank you for joining us today for our latest sermon from Pastor Hamilton on the Picture Perfect Family. We hope these insights into God's design for family have enlightened and encouraged you. Remember, a perfect family in God's eyes is one that seeks His guidance, holds love at its core, and remains united, no matter the struggles. For more sermons like this, visit our website, YouTube channel, or SoundCloud page. Share this message with loved ones and help spread God's Word. Until next time, stay blessed and keep your family in Christ.